everyone. My name is Heather Lee Booker, and I am the Product Marketing Director at Arena Solutions, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. On behalf of Arena, I'd like to welcome everyone. We, For our customers watching this event through our Arena event platform, this is the seventh in our series on Get More Done that we've been hosting over the past month. For our future customers joining us via the Zoom event, welcome. We don't normally open our customer events to our future customers. However, today we wanted to share this session as Ben and Ken have valuable lessons learned and experiences that will benefit you no matter what systems you're using today or plan to use in the future. We do have a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. So I will take you through that. We will have a short Q&A at the end of our panel discussion. If you have a question for our panelists, please get your questions in early. For our customers joining via the live stream broadcast and our Arena events platform, you can ask questions for our panelists through the Ask a Question panel, which you'll find to the right of the broadcast window. For our future customers joining us today in the Zoom webinar, please use the Zoom Q&A feature to ask any questions you may have. For our customers, you know an exciting feature of this Get More Done event series has been our Hashtag not your normal swag giveaways. We are doing it again today at the end of the event. Uh, future customers, we apologize that you aren't eligible today, but when you join as a customer, you would be eligible for giveaways at our events we do in the future. And finally, before we introduce our two customer panelists on the topic, I wanted to make everyone aware that our panelists are graciously sharing their experiences and opinions, not necessarily speaking for their companies in any official capacity. With that, let's get started. So today we're talking about what does it take to close the gaps in processes throughout the business? How do we remove silos and ensure a culture of communication and transparency? What do we need to do to ensure trust and compliance? All product companies, no matter what industry, have product processes that span teams who all have different vested interests and objectives. And our panelists today have a wonderful range of experience and I'd like to introduce them to you before we get into the questions. We have Ken Perino joining us. Ken has been in the medical device industry for over 27 years. He's had a successful record in startups all the way to larger companies, implementing goals, objectives, policies, procedures, and systems pertaining to the quality function, including quality systems implementation. FDA, ISO audit facilitation, regulatory compliance, regulatory submissions, and business systems implementations. And we're so happy to have him here. And then Dr. Ben Lachlan. Ben is a healthcare futurist, and he's worked for many top tier pharmaceutical and medical device companies. In 2020, he's been deeply involved in COVID-19 task forces at the state and federal levels, providing public health guidance and protocols and assessing treatments that are within trials, as well as top vaccine candidates. He's been widely featured in the media, including Forbes, NPR, The Wall Street Journal, and others. And his current focus is getting medical device and pharmaceutical products to market at a higher velocity and quality. Thank you, Ken and Ben, both for joining us. Thank you. So let's get started. Thank Thanks. We've got our videos on. We're, we're in our proper 2020 Zoom video um, mode. <laughs> so um, I, I know we're good to go. So I read first round review. I don't know if um, you guys do. I, I love the first round review um, kind of blog from first round capital. And recently they had an article from the uh, VP of product and strategy at Divi, Tyler Hogue. And he shared um, that he does things differently with his product and product and quality teams in that he thinks products should be tasked with delivering business outcomes and he goes on to share what that means in practical terms, like product owning, revenue generating responsibilities and risk management tasks. And he does this because he thinks it helps him avoid potential gaps or potholes as a company. And I kind of wanted to take that as a starting point. If um, you, know, what do you think companies and teams should do from the beginning? And, you know, with like Tyler, you're able to build a team from the beginning to avoid gaps and processes you know, or even if you're building a whole company, what are the key things you would focus on, the structures, the culture, the systems, to get it right kind of the first time and avoid future problems? Who did you want to jump in what on? What do that? you think? Whoever wants to go first. What do you think, Ben? Go ahead, ben. 
Well, I, if I take the question from where you started with Mr. Hogue's article, his perception of the, the, the PM is really that of a business development role, I think. Having fiduciary accountability is one of the things that he talks about in the article and how there are so many things involved in the PM schema that normally people don't think to be a part of it. Um, I think, you know, having the financial ties can be an important incentivizer for a PM to, to look at all the aspects of a business. But I think tracking and visual management of programs and subordinate projects and activities are the PMO's major remit. Um, I think in, in how I would design for a team or for a company, to me, it's a lot about what design for Six Sigma and quality by design have baked in, which is that the right process will deliver the right results time after time. So thinking about the intended goals and results is critical in my mind first to formulate the activities or if we're looking at the company wide level, the divisions of the company that would have to be involved in order to achieve desired outputs. Um, designing the processes using process flow diagrams to understand the start and end, the handoffs, inspection mm -hmm. or review steps and the overall tact, which is the customer expectation time and throughput capabilities. And whenever possible, I would recommend doing it visually so everybody can see at the same time what's going on and provide their input into the process design. And I think that's why there are these types of maps called value stream maps in Lean and they're designed from the end customer and you work backwards. So you start at the last step, which interfaces with the end customer. And then you say, what happens mm. to get there? And by working backwards, you keep everything closely aligned with customer expectations and desired outputs. I think it's very easy to get extraordinarily myopic, moving step by step in a forward flow direction, building in things that are unnecessary. Um, sometimes poorly designed processes can be bandaged or, or hidden, buttoned up by expert personnel. But I think also expertise isn't uh, a repeatable asset. And how one person approaches innovation or problem solving isn't how another one might. So making sure that you have repeatable process in place matters, I think, a lot to me here. And, and not relying on hope is the critical key. And then probably to that end, once the process has been designed, it's all about measurement. So measuring the pilot activities, ongoing performance to ensure that any process improvements can be implemented, um, that you can properly characterize the outputs and directionally move the team, the organization, the activities, what, you know, whichever level you're at, move it forward with efficiency as well as effectiveness. Oh, that's great. I love the, I love uh, working backwards um, from the end. Um, Ken, what, you know, what do you think about, you know, obviously what Ben shared and then, you know, what, what would you, what do you focus on, you know, when you start from the ground? So, I, I think one thing to, to also uh, have have in your uh, have in your in your box of tricks a little bit is understanding, you know, if if we're in the medical field, we're we're dealing with regulations, either the FDA regulations, ISO regulations, country specific regulations, and so in my experience, that seems to have been a purview of like the quality department or the regulatory department. And um, what I've tried to do throughout my career is is actually get those people that are in different departments, but also, but, but have a role in complying with the regulation, purchasing, for example, or supplier management, those types of, those types of things. Getting those people involved and having them understand the regulations that we, that they in, in their department need to, need to comply with, and then helping them understand that there's nuances to the regulation but the key is to, to have the simplest business process possible while, make, while meeting the regulations. That's been the key. And I think Ben said it the same in, in, in a way. If you make a, a business process more complex, then that's, that's a choice. And you have, to, you have to realize it's a choice that, that you're going to make. There's been plenty of times where I've been on uh, as part of the team flowing out a business process, working with them, and then you know people will will have their previous experience from a different company, and they said, well, this is the way we used to do it, 
And then I would bring up the fact, well, that's a little bit more than the regulation is requiring. So let's look at the reg. The reg calls for this. I know your experience, you were doing this, this, and this. We can do that here if we choose for our business, but it's more than what the regulation requires. So that, I mean, if you don't, if you, if you have a very complex process on paper that and bring it into electronic system, now you have a complex process in electronic system. So and getting back to Ben's point, the metrics are very important. Again, the more complex the process, probably the more metrics you're going to have, and that requires resources. So keep that in mind. Um, but also any changes that you're going to be looking at to do in the future. It's, it's simple to make a simple process more complex, but making a complex process more simple is not very simple. <laughs> I know it sounds like a word, word thing, but it's, it's not very simple to do that because now you've got resources, you've got procedures, you've got all these things set up for this complex process. And now you start taking the bricks away from the foundation and everybody's going, oh my God, I'm, I'm feeling really shaky here. So start as, start as simple as you can is, is my, while meeting the regulations and the standards, of course. No, that's great. I, uh, I, you know, I think, you know, like Ben said, focusing on the, the outcomes that you need to get to, the metrics, I love the visualization ideas. Um, and, you know, I was talking with uh, another customer, uh, I think last week, and she shared, you know, the VP of engineering, and she shared one of her dreaded phrases was, this is how we've always done it, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever she was like, why did we make this? Why, why, why did we go down this road? Why did we make this process so complex? And they're like, well, this is how we've always done it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that kind of leads to, you know, if we, if we move away from being able to build something from ground up, you know, most of us don't have that luxury. And we often have to just work with where we are, right? Where our teams are, our processes are, um, whatever we step into when we step into that role of that company. And um, a a few months ago, we had Tony Byros, um, who is at Insulet as the Global Documentation Training Compliance Director, and he was on one of our events a couple of months ago, like you, and he talked about how important buy-in is. Um, he said he felt like he spends a longer time getting all the stakeholders together, collecting input, getting buy-in, um, you, know, you know, longer time there than it takes to implement any project in question. You know, whether it's a system like Arena or a new process or he said even after you implement a system or a process, he says he spends a tremendous amount of time when things get bumpy or people want to make things too complex or um, have problems people adopting a new process or system. He says he, he feels like he's always selling, basically, is what he said. And mm -hmm. um, it would be interesting to see for both of you if, you, if that's in your experience and then you know, what do you do? What, what are the kind of tactics you've used within teams and across with your peers, you know, with the other teams to get the buy-in, right? To make big changes, whether it's, you know, putting a new system in or a new process or just fixing things like trust. And, you know, what have you done that works? And I don't know if either of you have had any failures to share, but <laughs> what do you do to get buy-in? Well, I, I can I can take this one. I think um, so. I've, there's been a few times in my career when I've been hired to actually come in, and it's either it's typically both. It's it, it might be the department that may may not be working as efficiently or successfully with other departments, um, and or it's the tools that are that were put in place that really aren't scalable or not working. Uh, if the company gets approval, FDA approval, and we need to scale, the, the current SIP tools aren't going to be there, so aren't, aren't going to work. So that comes, both of those comes with some challenges, and it's, and it's around the people and, and their experience, right? So I've, I guess I've been successful in, in listening and listening and listening and listening to more. That's in my mind, in my experience, that's been the key because the pain points for each of the departments, for each of the people in those departments is different. No matter how many companies um, we go work for, the pain points and the actual, um, the actual problems within that department are gonna be a little bit different. 
Um, and so getting, being able to listen and, and getting the, getting, what I, what I try and do is get the larger team involved as well in a department, say for mm -hmm. instance, rather than just the manager, get the people, get the other people involved as well. Because you really need to understand what everybody's pain is with that one process or with that tool. If we talk about electronic tools, been been there a, more than a few times where we we need to replace the current tool. But there was such a bad taste in implementing that tool to begin with. Everybody lost trust with all electronic tools, and they really just wanted to go back mm. to paper. And so that's a, that's a hurdle to get over. But again, listening, understanding where they're coming from, make sure they understand that you are there to help their process become more simple that they that makes their job their daily job easier and then an electronic tool kind of showing them what a tool that is more geared to what they're looking to do to match their needs what it looks like start mm -hmm. small and and don't and don't you know go in there with the idea that they are going to be the process owner and I'm going to help them run their process efficiently and more simple using, perhaps using electronic tool than, than they currently are, trying to take as much of their pain away as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if I jump in here, I, it's an interesting question, an approach that Mr. Byros takes. Um, what I'll call processed and by committee having kind of the full democracy across the stakeholders, oftentimes I, I find is a recipe for disaster because you end up in more of a situation of groupthink and, you know, what's called this notion of Abilene paradox where nobody in the end really gets what mm -hmm. they want and everybody has settled. And so I think, you know, it's difficult because for buy-in and participation, it depends on the change. So buy-in is, um, in my mind, not specifically required, but participation is always a must. Much like how Lexus, uh, whose parent company, Toyota, and Aston Martin, they don't ask for my input in how to design their cars or their process steps. <laughs> and I don't always want to strive for that level of agreement across unrelated functions in a company for every change, because then what it ends up doing is just bogging down the decision-making engine for everything across mm. the organization. I think Steve Jobs felt this way as well to some degree. And, you know, he famously stated that the customer doesn't really they want until we tell them. And I think it applies by the way to internal customers too. So the process should be in my mind designed and developed and deployed. So kind of the three D's designed, developed, deployed by those who own and oversee the process and the results back to measurement, they're measured to see what impact they have and, and the interaction with other functions, for example, where the handoffs are. And then the beauty there is showing competitive metrics not only drives accountability, but the sociotypical drive to persevere, just as in any competitive endeavor, you show what the other functions are doing maybe as part of this new um, innovative approach or undertaking for the company and everybody sees how the metrics maybe all align or interrelated and then you've got kind of a competition built in and behind all of it more so in my mind in the buy-in is trust and credibility and mm -hmm. i think the trust and credibility are the key facets that leaders can keep going back to the well and drawing on in times of organizational stress um, the flip side of that is losing trust and credibility means that all active participation and engagement drops precipitously in the company across the board. So it requires really nurturing the trust and credibility, so much asking every time for buy-in, but ensuring that there's always an open conduit of communication, that you've got appropriate measures and that you're again, designing with the end goal in mind. Mm -hmm. No, I think this was a great discussion. and I. I mean, we've all we've all seen, you know, kind of the uh, paralysis by analysis um, situation, right? Where um, you spend way too much time in committees and trying to, you know, kind of get that buy-in. You get paralyzed. Um, I, I think both of you, would, you know, what I loved was 
you know, certainly my experience working with many, uh, many companies over two decades implementing um, complex tools to support the business processes is about that participation that you talked about then and getting, making sure people feel heard. Um, I think is really valuable, um, you know, but like you said, avoiding getting their participation, showing the big picture of where everything's going and how their part fits into the whole. I think you both talked about that. I've, I've often experienced, at least when I will talk with individual teams, they, they often cannot articulate very well what happens before them and after them in the processes. You know, why what they do is really important at a bigger macro level. Um, and that, that in itself can help, you know, kind of um, de-escalate when they feel threatened, right, or encourage, like you talked, the trust. I think the trust um, situation is key um, to, you know, kind of getting, getting everyone to come along and, you know, um, go along with the flow. And like you said, in, in the end, it's not really a democracy. Um, a company is not really a democracy. Although I will say I've worked with enough engineering teams that I feel like um, I, I, I feel um, pretty firm that engineers in particular, although I think other, or, other users in the organization can definitely shelfware almost any software if they really don't like it. <laughs> but, but you want to avoid that situation. Um, this is great. So let's, um, we're going to shift gears I can talk about communication a little bit and um, going into building trust and I think participation and Ben you had been a part of our innovation campaign early this year it was before COVID-19 dis um, disrupted everything I think it was December January um, and interestingly enough you know you you shared a quote I think in our innovation campaign you talked about um, this a ward ribbon you have hanging, I guess, probably in your office office. I don't know if you brought it to your home office, but, um, you know, this award ribbon that says, I just survived another meeting that should have been an email. And you felt like you had won that, you know, thousands of times over your career. Um, and of course, we all chuckle because we've all been in meetings that shouldn't have happened or could have been a lot shorter. Um, most of those meetings have gone virtual for a lot of us, and I, I don't know, I think it might actually have helped develop better meeting skills, I hope, these virtual meetings. But I kind of wanted to, to use that and because and, I, I think you're touching on a challenge, which is really effective communication. And, um, you know, what are some of the key things that you both have done to help teams effectively communicate kind of the, you know, the right details, the right time without, you know, holding kind of agendaless meetings or, you know, long emails that nobody reads or, you know, building, you know, you talked about inflexible workflows, Ken, to cover every corny case. But, you know, as leaders of teams, you know, your, your teams watch you and model how you communicate. So, you know, what do you do to kind of model the communication you want to have happen in, in your teams and across your teams? Right, Okay, uh, I, I think as far as the ribbon, yeah, I, I did bring it home. Uh, I'm going to dig it up for you. And I feel like I'm still w winning it every week. Um, the, the virtual world of meetings amid COVID-19 has unfortunately manifested a new meeting lifestyle where it's just so convenient to, to book WebEx or Zoom meetings for everyone uh, at a moment's notice and then expect that they'll all participate. So through the course of a day, every 30 minute time slot becomes fair game for people to just randomly book. Unfortunately, I think to me, the nexus of the problem is that good innovation doesn't occur in 30 minute increments. So, you know, somebody might say, oh, Ben has a 30 minute slot at 2.30 today that's free and they book me. And, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be prepared and on the ball to have innovation floweth from the meeting and it just doesn't work that way i think the new virtual mm -hmm. meeting structure that we're all living has taken a huge bite out of innovative capacity within companies insofar as companies that have allowed employees to free think and that's why you know back way back when decades ago 3m had purpose built in time every day for their engineers uh, mm -hmm. to to free think and allow them to daydream and come up with new ideas and it can't it cannot happen when we're constantly interrupted by an unsary string of online meetings each day. So the short answer is I think in one way it's gotten worse. Um, mm -hmm. 
the only the only upside is it's not requiring everyone to commute into the office to to co-locate and be held hostage in the same room we can all be held hostage from our respective homes on zoom but the the other thing too that kind of concerns me with the situation is the sharing of nonverbal cues so even with video um, like when schools went remote to, to remote learning and bring with COVID-19, those who were able to do remote, you know, it was a bridge and it was the first time it was done on such a large scale. But I think, um, you know, even though that's provided a lot, of, a lot of tech avenues that never existed before and it was in some ways great, it in a lot of other ways was not so great because we know that from a psychological and neurocognitive perspective that 80%, over 80% of the content in a discourse between individuals is nonverbal cues. So even with video, things like, is the other person diaphoretic? Are they fidgeting? They're, those things are largely mm -hmm. unseeable. You, you know, are they twitching their foot, which is maybe a social cue that I have to wrap this meeting up or whatever. Um, I think there's a lot that you still <laughs> lose with video and um, I don't know, you know, I think as far as how should these all be run, I think the idea of, you know, forcing agendas is an interesting one. People have come to expect that for any given meeting in the workplace, we've got agendas, but most people never pre-read agendas. And in life, the vast, vast majority of all of our discussions don't have an agenda. So it's not something that, that human beings have evolved to require. So I don't think agenda are always necessary. Um, it is okay to just bounce ideas off one another in an informal way, as you might with friends or family. So, you know, also having this notion that you, I've got an online meeting, I've got to set up video with the call, I have to have an agenda for it. It becomes a structure that uh, is not really how humans are, are necessarily designed to communicate. So I think we're making do with what we have and what we can do, but it's not 100% optimal. Mm -hmm. No, that's fascinating. Yeah. I, uh, Ken, yeah, what do you think? Well, no, I would agree 100%. I mean, uh, going, you know, we were talking about this before the, before the, the we went live, um, that, that I don't think, um, even though we're able to do this, we're able to get a lot of work done. There's a lot of the social interaction that um, is missing. And, and with that comes more challenges, you know, like, like Ben was saying, yeah, you know, you're you're always on, meaning you're sort of always available. So for those quick little things, hey, can we talk real quick? Yeah, this has been a bit of a great help. However, it's hard to get your work done, you know, the work that you have to get done from all of these meetings when you're continually in all of these meetings and they just pop mm -hmm. up all the time. Um, you know, I guess what I was thinking about when I was thinking about this question was um, so rather than having an agenda, some of the, some of the meetings have a, have a purpose that, that I think people innately get. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the, the metrics type meetings. Hey, we're going to, we're going to every week, we're going to go look at uh, the complaints and the kappas and this and that. And those people that get invited, they have topics that they need to, you know, talk about. So that's more, very much more targeted. Um, um, and I think, I think people sort of, okay, I get this. I know, I know what, the, I know what I'm doing here and I can provide value. Um, uh, but the, the other ones where you're, like I said, you're constantly just, you're constantly pulled away from trying to do something, innovate on something or, or whatnot. It's, it's a challenge. Um, and, and maybe we just, we try and group those into, hey, Let's set some time time aside each week, and for for an hour on Thursdays or something, and that's the time where we go we take care of those. And if there's nothing that week, there's nothing that week. So mm -hmm. it, it, this has definitely been a different challenge that uh, that we're all dealing with for sure. Yeah, agreed. I did I did pull a ribbon. Here it is. <laughs> hey, there it is. It's a real ribbon. I love it. I love it. It's a real ribbon. I, you know, I, I think this is fascinating because um, having worked mostly virtual for 20 years in my career, um, 
I found, unlike, you know, I think my peers who have been mostly in the office and all of a sudden gone home, you know, talking with other people who, you know, have spent their career mostly virtual, you know, the cadence, the shift, you know, what you were talking about, you know, both of you were people are just now, um, you know, calling because, of course, you're not, you know, they're used to being right there at the, the cubicle or to walk over. And so they they do that now, but virtually, but because they're home, what I found it fascinating for me is that, you know, prior to 2020, I had, I had expectations about, you know, both my, you know, internal teams I work with at Arena, as well as, you know, customers that I talk with, you know, you would go home. And once you went home from the office, you, you usually weren't trying to reach me, right? You know, so I was like, oh, in California, it's past five, six o'clock. And, you know, or even before, maybe they call me while they're commuting home and their death commute of, you know, an hour and a half. But otherwise, once they're home, they're home. But now, right, so what's fascinating to me is kind of these, the norms, the modes, and everything has shifted. So it's been very normal in 2020 for me, you know, to have both internal team and even customers texting or calling or emailing me at, you know, 8, 9, and 10 o'clock at night, you know, um, you know, West Coast time, because their, their boundaries of when work happens has shifted too, right? Mm -hmm. So now is it kind of interrupt driven and they just pick things up, but all of a sudden I'm like, why, why is, why is somebody from product, you know, and expecting an answer that was, you know, to your, to your point, Ken, like, you know, I think that, or Ben about coming up with something valuable to give them back right but they're expecting an answer because um they can reach out <laughs> and, they're, yeah. and they're working at 10 o'clock at night from their couch or whatever their situation is because yeah. we're all have these different schedules now so it's been very fascinating and um, and i do think i like your point about purpose um you know ben about purposes of meetings i know one of the most valuable meetings I have right now is actually with the product team and we have it every week. There isn't an agenda really. Um, the product director, we, you know, the, the purpose, the purpose is to have a share, you know, what's going on across the product managers, across our, our uh, quality and validation team, our UX people, and then myself from product and customer marketing. And we just, it's a round robin share, but it's probably one of my most valuable meetings because the purpose is to see what, what's going on and how can we all connect, right? Mm -hmm. And it really gives me information that's useful. Um, but there's no agenda, but it's, it's, uh, it's a great, it's, it's actually one of the meetings I look forward to. So I think, that's, I think those are great observations. So let's shift gears just a little. Oh, we lost our slide. Oh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> So can you let's talk a little bit about kind of systems and um, implementing systems and the approach. And you both have implemented many systems. I know Ken, you've been at numerous companies that have utilized PLM and QMS systems, including Arena, several times, but other systems previously as well. And you know, both of you know we talked about gaps in processes, and usually when a company is looking to either put a system in or replace. Um, an existing system, there's often a lot of gaps in those processes that are driving the needs, right? Um, you know, data may be in all kinds of different siloed systems and plus on paper, you know, we have, you know, pain points potentially, you know, whether they're quality events or, you know, design, design challenges that have resulted in scrap and rework and all these things. And I know, Ken, we talked before about some of the implementations you've done where you really are a fan of the phased plan to implement a solution mm -hmm. like Arena, you know, putting in the foundation and then kind of rolling through different capabilities. And, um, and earlier you talked about, you know, it's easy to make things more complicated, but um, harder to make them simple. So in this idea of crawl, walk, run, when it comes mm -hmm. to implementing systems, you know, maybe talk a little bit about, you know, how do you decide what processes to focus on, you know, first, second, third, um, you know, What's been your experience with this approach, and you know how do you, how do you take teams through that? Sure, sure. So, so I would say there's there's three things that I found successful in implementing uh, electronic systems. Um, one is being able to uh, talk about and and give the give the team sort of the vision of how an electronic system, once it's fully implemented 
how things can be connected and how, again, their life is hopefully will be much better, much their work, their daily work life will be easier by using the electronic system because they're, they're going to be able to connect data in, in ways that they can't now, for example. When it comes to the actual implement, implementation, um, I've found the phase, mo the phase approach of doing it to be, to be very successful um, for two reasons, really. One, the, the, for the implementation team, the actual team who's doing the implementation, it gives them um, a chance to learn how to validate and implement on a module basis, right? Once they get it down, then they just, it's sort of repeat it for the next one, right? So because we have people have to realize there's 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 some documentation that's involved in implementing and validating an electronic system, and if you're able to kind of chop it up into smaller pieces, that means your implementation team kind of gets good at it, you know. The first, the first right. implemented, no matter which one it is, is always going to be the longest um, because it's the first time they're going through it. All the validation <laughs> documents sort of new and they have to go through it all. Um, but the second one's going to be better because now they have a template and they just kind of follow through. I think the other thing that's important for doing a phased approach is even for the entire company, you, um, it's, it's smaller bite-sized pieces for the entire company. So if you do a, just one module, then the, then the entire company gets used to things like the user interface and logging in um, so that so that they're not their their whole life doesn't change overnight just a piece of it mm -hmm. and then that grows so you get sort of these small wins that that grow over time and um, so specifically the what i've typically the module that i've or modules that i've that i've implemented first is document document control and then Tr employee training, which are typically together in one module, um, mainly because if you even if you've been paper based for the past 30 years, you are familiar with it. You have a procedure you need to follow and you have to be trained on that procedure. So innately, everybody in a company should understand there's document control and I have to be trained to my document. Right. And typically I found typically this isn't 100% Typically, document control and employee training are relatively built simple processes. Hmm. I've seen some complex ones, don't get me wrong, but for the most part, document control is, here's your document, needs to be approved, needs to be archived, boom. Employee training, you're in this department, here's your responsibilities, here's what you can be trained to, boom, you're done. So typically, those, pro those business processes are relatively simple. And the majority of the company knows about those, so so implementing those first, it kind of gets everybody familiar um, with an electronic tool in a business process that they are typically already familiar with. So, and then we kind of move on from there. The other thing is the the uh, the other business process, the quality module, for example, with the quality events or cap as those those other processes, those are the ones where I've seen them to be. A little too com complex and you need to spend more time trying to simplify try to get that business process the way you want it and then you automate you just again like i said before if you automate a complex business process now you have a business process that's complex mm -hmm. in an electronic environment and that's not helping anybody so yeah that's, that's it's great i don't know ben yeah t tell me what you think about this phase approach where do you start I like it. I like the idea of crawl, walk, run. Uh, that was the riddle of the Sphinx, wasn't it? What has yes, four legs in the was. morning, two legs in the <laughs> afternoon, and three legs in the evening? Uh, it is. Yeah. Um, Einstein once said, you know, going back to this idea of simplicity, right? Things, and this is really an Einstein quote, not one of those ones that is purported to have been, but things should be made as simple as possible and no simpler. And I think it's kind of the same way with this. It meant by that was there's always a maximum value of simplicity and beyond which you begin stripping content of value from your endeavor. You can only get so simple and you can always look complexity on later. 
I also think it's easier to edit than to create. So if we look at the original iPhone, mm. which um, I've been thinking about recently because it turned 13 years old this summer, it took years of kind of going back to the idea of unbothered innovation. It took years of unbothered innovation to design and release that idea of the touchscreen smartphone into a physical object. And then each competitor in six of generation uh, started coming out one to two years apart. And, you know, now it's just this endless cycle and they evergreen the market, which we're still in. Um, so I think streamlining is a bit like editing. So you have to have a process design in place in, in some level of deployment. If you ever want to hope to have an impact with efficiency gains, you know, you can just make things better if you haven't done kind of the crawl and walk first before you're ready to run. Trying to streamline a process a priori that doesn't actually exist is an exercise in fantasy because you're trying to think about all the things that could go wrong. You know, the Donald Rumsfeld unknown unknowns or the known unknowns. <laughs> um, I would say additionally, great successes today don't necessarily guarantee survival into the future. And that's why we need to keep innovating and thinking about processes. Look at how Ericsson, Nokia, Blackberry, um, Ericsson, Nokia, Blackberry, some of the biggest early mobile device rulers of the world at the front end of things. And now for the most part, they're also RANs in this highly jockeyed horse race and they're way behind uh, Samsung, Apple and Google. So one must continue to innovate to stay viable. And it's this, this idea of the red queen effect, you know, constantly having to move forward in Alice in Wonderland, the idea that if you're not continuously moving at high velocity forward, then you'll fall behind. And I think the famous quality guru W. Edwards Damon quote speaks directly to this, which is that uh, change is not required because survival is not mandatory. So people don't have to take on the idea of good process creation or control or improvement. And the reality is, you know, there's no guarantee that businesses will survive. So if you want one, you have to do the other. No, it's great. I think I, you know, I think this crawl, walk, run, you know, um, you know, as Ken said, focusing on um, simple first is fascinating because we often have, you know, customers, and certainly my experience has been they often want to solve the biggest problem first, right? But the biggest problem or the thing that's the most painful is often the most complex to solve, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and not, you know, it's not the small win that you talked about, Ken. And you know, to your point, Ben, instead of Instead, if they focus on something simple, but that has value, right? I mean, you don't want it so simple that no one sees it as a win, but, you know, simple that has value is um, a great way to approach it. I'm going to, I'm going to have all our solution architects listen to this um, <laughs> and start rethinking maybe how they advise some people on, on implementations or um, use this as kind of ammunition to, to uh, push back when they want to go after the most complex thing first. Um, to your point, Ben, you talk about, you know, constantly changing and innovating our kind of last, um, you know, we're getting close to time, but I, you know, last question, which is hard to avoid in 2020 because we are in um, arguably one of the most disrupt disruptive events, um, you know, certainly in our lifetimes that, you know, has had a global impact on everything from business and how we do business, how we create products and, um, how we deliver products, you know, customer, um, you know, the capacity for customers, the demand that customers have for products, and then how we're all living, um, you know, everything, you know, from our kids and schooling to, um, uh, you know, for some people, very real issues of, of employment and, and stability. So, you know, in this kind of in a, this disruptive um space that we're in, um, you know, what are, you know, kind of these are, you know, our last closing thoughts, you know, what have, what have you learned or what have, what have you been thinking about with regards to, you know, what do you do with these unexpected events? You know, what are the opportunities it gives us? And, you know, to your point, you know, Ben, on innovation, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of pain and horror that's coming out of 2020, but then, of course, there's, there's opportunities as well. So, you know, what, what are your thoughts there? 
Yeah, I think a, a lot of great societal shifts and innovations have always come at the end of unexpected events. So I don't maybe always see things like the craziness of calendar year 2020 as a bad thing. Um, oftentimes new opportunities open up in the vacuum of the receding status quo. So as you know, what we knew before starts to go away, behind that there's necessarily a vacuum where we can usher in new thinking. Um, in his book, The Black Swan, Nassim Nicholas Taleb talks about mm. these black swan events that are very rare, highly consequential things that, that can occur globally. And you can't really predict them because if you could, then everybody would and they wouldn't be black swans. But the idea is you can insulate yourself from risk so that it, you are more anti-fragile, which is the title of one of his other books. But, um, you know, that's in a whole separate story. But the idea is you can't always know everything with 100% forecasting. You can't always be 100% effective at fortifying yourself, but you insulate yourself from risk. You make it so that when these disruptions do occur, you're ready to fill the void rather than just be swept away by the wake. Um, I think the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 certainly qualifies as one of these highly consequential world-changing events. In the wake of COVID-19's grip on society and the media, we've had to force challenges onto the status quo, like the idea of working in the office or totally remote. Um, how we return to restaurants and bars. Do we reopen schools? Mm. When do we reopen? Even like testing the safety and efficacy in clinical trials uh, for drug treatments and preventive vaccines. So in the past, uh, a vaccine phase one to three would have taken customarily years. And now we're looking at a situation where we may have a couple of vaccine candidates ready for approval in maybe eight to 10 months. So I think, again, in the wake of these consequential shifts come opportunities, which we would never have innovated to the same degree if they were to occur more incrementally. And so I would also say incrementality can be enormously effective too, but it's not equivalent to grand scale sweeping changes. So there's kind of two ways to look at things. And actually, if I think to process improvement in the world of lean, those two are disparate concepts. If you've heard of Kaizen, that essentially translates into good change or change for the better. So companies will do Kaizen events to try to improve something. That's incremental usually, but the flip side is there is also what's called kaikaku, which translates into radical change. And so those are the things that are more like a sweeping overhaul where you lift and shift something into its place. So I think there are always opportunities that come from gigantic changes. And sometimes if incremental change isn't getting you to where you need to be, maybe you should consider how it could be that you could approach it from a radical change overhaul standpoint. Hmm. That's great. Ken, what are your thoughts about the unexpected events we're facing and, and opportunity? Yeah, no, I, you know, Ben, Ben brings up a lot of good points and I would, I would agree with, I would agree with all of them. Um, I would, you know, I guess, to be honest with the, uh, my team and I'm, ex ex as well as the extended team in my, in the company, we've talked about this for, a while now, really since it started back in March and April, um, and and what we've I can, what we've found was you know being open and being able to talk about what you're I guess what you're going through you know individually uh, is important, and I think the other thing that that is nice to see even from all the way up the uh, the top management is the realization that we are working, let's say the opportunity to work throughout the day and into the evening is there now more than it was before all this started. You know, for I think for a lot of people, it used to be once you get in your car to go back home, that was your mental shut off. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of done with work for today. Maybe you go home, maybe you do a few things, but that was sort of your mental break from work. Well, we don't have that anymore, right? We, because we're all home and we're here. And so I think, you know, the, the senior management team got together and said, listen, we understand and we appreciate, don't get, don't get us wrong. 
we appreciate your your wanting your to work but realize you need to take breaks if you're going to be up late because you're going to be on meetings with another country well you got to take some time sometime during the day either be with the kids or do something to get that mental break so that you're not burnt out because that is that's a bad that's a bad consequence of what this can do to to all of us if we're lucky enough to be working it's a consequence that because you can just work and work and work and work and work so mm -hmm. we, we got to you know our, uh, it was nice to see our, our our senior management team kind of bring that up and said listen people you, you need to take a break because we've got we've got offices in japan and taiwan all over and so we are on meetings late at night which is which is great but you can't work from seven in the morning to 10 at night every day you're just you're going to get burned out so got to be able you to can. Take yeah you can if they can book your calendar yeah <laughs> there you go <laughs> you might want might want to block out those times yeah, time, we, are, we are calendar management we are we are close to the end of our time and this has been an awesome discussion um i i, I hope that both of you have had um as much fun as i have we're gonna because we're so close to time, we're going to skip over the question part and, and kind of talk about mental break. One of the things that we've been doing um, in these customer events um, as kind of a, a fun thing for our customers and a mental break is um, doing some of these giveaways, um, uh, kind of not, not your normal swag and kind of brighten people's days. And surprisingly, this I think has been um, something that people have enjoyed because we, uh, while we've done it for this series of events so that you two know what's funny is we had our, as you know, our summer 20 released recently and we always do those sneak peek events um, with product management before, you know, before the release, about four weeks before the release. and. And when we did our sneak peek with product management um, for the summer 20 event um, about a month and a half ago, one of the biggest questions we got actually during the event for complaints, I guess we would call it a complaint back was how come we didn't do any giveaways in our sneak peek? <laughs> um, because we've been doing them for this event series and we were like, oh no, that's for the speaker event series, not for the product sneak peek. So they were like, where's the, where's the giveaway? Where's the Yeti cup for? Um, so, uh, the good news is we're going to do it um, right now. And, um, you know, what we do for those who haven't been on our live broadcast, we, we do a raffle. Um, uh, we select two names at random for those who are on the call right now. So if you watch the recording after today, um, you obviously didn't get a chance to win, but maybe you'll join us for the, you know, for the next one. And so I've got someone who drops me the names in our Zoom. So we, we give two things away. Our first is our Yeti. Arena Flask, which is actually, um, I, I love Yeti products um, because they're really good. And um, and also, I guess, because my husband's active duty military. And if, if you have any active duty military um, family members, if you don't know, if you go to Yeti's website, they do um, an incredible discount, actually, for um, military, which is, um, which is appreciated. But our Yeti Flask winner is, hold on, is Eric Feldhaus. Um, who's um, at Zodiac. And so Eric, congratulations um, for the Yeti. We'll get that in the mail to you, um, snail mail, um, in, um, very shortly. And then what we've been doing, I don't know if, if Ben and Ken, if you've joined any of our other live events, um, our second um, giveaway we've been doing is we choose to do a giveaway from one of our customers obviously we have to limit ourselves to kind of the consumer level product company <laughs> so not your companies and not um not some of our larger you know satellite platform companies and things like that um we've given away um you know products from sonos and cry cut and um, whoop which is kind of one of my new favorite um athlete fitness band um companies but today we're actually giving away a den five um, Fossil Smartwatch, um, another one of our customers, and um, that's going to James Broderick, uh, who's at ISDI Limited. Um, congratulations, James. We'll email you and work out the logistics of, of which of the Gen 5s you want and um, get that sent to you. And again, if you didn't join live and you're watching the recording or um, uh, you should join live again, um, 
and in the future to to maybe to snag something fun. Um, ben and Ken, you guys will get one of our Yeti floss, by the way. I haven't told them. They don't know this if you're watching us live. Um, but as a thank you to our um, to our panelists, we always send you an arena Yeti floss. So you'll be getting one as well, too. All right. Um, thank you. Yay. Thank you. They're, they're great. Um, so I wanted to thank you guys for sharing, um, you know, your wisdom experience um, with us. For um, customers, if you're watching through the Arena Events platform, complete the session survey after we log off. You'll find it um, in the session you're currently in. I, I understand I got a text partway through. We've been having some technical difficulties with the Arena Events platform with the stream from Zoom to um, to the arena events platform so if it was interrupted for you at any point in time um, as you know customers we always record these events and put them back on the arena events platform so we'll get that up for you in the next day or two so that you can watch the whole session and get everything that ben and ken um, shared with us um, for future customers if you're joining us from the zoom um, you will get a link sent to you with the recording and then um, customers of course if you're interested in being in Ben and Ken's um, kind of hot spot and, and sharing with us on another customer panel then just email us at um, arena events or, or at events sorry events at arena solutions.com or contact us um, through the event platform thank you everyone for joining us thank you Ben and Ken um, hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day